morning, everyone. Welcome to the 2018 Senior Symposium. Today we have Kaylin Dyer, Paris Smith, and Jack Lipsy. They're going to be talking about sustainable agriculture, the integration of aquaponics at Punta Luna Resort. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much, uh, and thanks for being with us this morning to kick off the symposium. Uh, so we'll be talking to you today about sustainable agriculture, specifically the integration of aquaponics at Punta Leona Hotel and Club in Costa Rica. My name is Kaylin. I'm Paris. I'm Jack. And our advisors are Dr. Altai and Dr. Conley, and uh, we are also fortunate enough to have our clients here today, uh, two representatives, Joe and Rainier, sitting in the audience, so we're really excited about that too. Um, so we wanted to start by giving some background about how we got started with this project and our client. So we're all ISAP majors and we really wanted to find a project that could tie together all of our interdisciplinary knowledge that we've been studying over the past four years. And so we wanted a project that had energy, environment, and cultural context. So this seemed like the perfect fit. Um, and we wanted to work with this client because they have a mission of making conservation and sustainable development a high priority in all of the projects that they do in Costa Rica and they strive to maintain, protect, and promote ecologi ecological balance within that district that they're located in. And you can see they're right on the west coast of Costa Rica, right where that pin drop is. Um, so to uphold these pr uh, principles in their mission statement, they wanted to improve their food production system on site at the resort and also improve resident education. So that's kind of where we came into the picture. And um, we also worked with a fourth group member, Jocelyn, who couldn't be here today uh, because she graduated last semester, but she was really integral to this project and uh, was made it successful with us. Um, so we wanted to move on and kind of give you a timeline of this whole thing because it was two years long and a big ordeal. Uh, so we started with cultural discov or con contextual discovery in fall 2016. That's really when we signed on to the project. And we were just uh, beginning our partnership with Punta Leona and getting client requests at that point and figuring out where we were going to take this. Moving into the spring of 2017, we started our system ideation and prototyping. Uh, so we examined a lot of different types of aquaponics and sustainable agriculture. And we did a lot of interviews with farmers who already had these systems set up, figured out what worked and what didn't. Um, and from there, we created a SketchUp on Google SketchUp. It's just a model. Um, you can see it there. And this was kind of like the prototype of our project. And from there, we were able to create a bill of materials to send to our client um, to get those ordered. Uh, transitioning into the summer, when we would be there, all of our materials would also be there. So summer of 2017, we go to Costa Rica for three weeks, and we begin system construction and um, implement the system completely and begin preparing materials to pass along to our clients so that they can continue to make this project a success and make it their own. Transitioning into the fall of 2017, uh, we began an ecological analysis, kind of like the back end of everything. We started comparing the old food system that existed at the resort to the new system now that the aquaponics was implemented. And uh, we also began collecting system productivity data from the resort itself with their help um, recording that weekly. And then fast forward to now, spring 2018, uh, we began compiling uh, spending and payback data to figure out if this was an economic investment and um, how beneficial it was for the resort and also began visualizing that system productivity data um, that we had been collecting all year. So from there, um, we kind of transition into the beginning of our project after that quick overview. So this is a aerial view of the property that we were working with. Um, this is the resort itself. And um, so the land that we were given is right here to build the aquaponics system. It's right next to a butterfly house that already exists. So we figured it'd be a per perfect opportunity to combine this educational uh, system that already exists already and the residents can kind of just have a one-stop shop um, for getting that uh, ecotourism education that Puntz Leona prides itself on. And then 
the restaurant that we would be providing the food for is located right down there, so it's just a short walk um, and a quick transport. And the rest of what you see is just various housing units um, and the resort uh, usually sleeps, or maximum capacity, capacity is 600 people, it's usually around 80% full and they're looking sometimes at up to 6,000 visitors. This means like just beach day goers, um, club members, and but all of those people take advantage of the food services there as well, so it's pretty high population. So as we've slightly touched on, <coughs> we implemented an aquaponics system, and so I'm just gonna give you a brief background on what aquaponics is. As you can see in this image, there are fish and plants in our system, and it's modeled after a natural ecological system. Aquaponic systems produce animals and food, or animals and plants for food in a closed ecological system. <coughs> Hydroponics are something that you might have heard of. They're a little more, more widespread, and they're very similar, but they don't have fish or other aquatic animals in the systems. So essentially for the system, the fish produce wastes, and the water from the fish water with the fish waste and nutrients in it is pumped up into a grow area where there are plants and bacteria break down the fish waste so that the plants can take access to these nutrients and this cuts out the need for added fertilizers into our system. So essentially the fish get clean water from the plants and the plants get nutrients to grow from the fish. There's a lot of different types of aquaponics system. These are three of the main types that are more widely implemented. The first type that you can see here is a deep water culture. And as you can see, there are fish in that separate fish tank to the side. And then there are separate water tanks for the plants to grow in on, on rafts. So in these systems, the plants are growing directly in water. They can't grow in the same tank as the fish. They have to be separated. Otherwise, the fish will eat the plant roots and they can damage the plants that way. Another type of aquaponic system is a media bed unit, which you can see in the top up there. This type of system has a grow media, and a typical grow media that you might think about would be soil. But in this case, and other aquaponic systems, we use gravel, red lava rock, or other kind of rocky substances as our grow media. And in this same system, the water is piped from the fish tank into the grow media and so the plant roots are always submerged in water in this system as well. The last type of system is a nutrient film technique system <coughs> and from now on we'll probably refer to that as NFT so if you hear us say NFT we're talking about the nutrient film technique system that you can see here. In this system there's pipes that the water is funneled into and the plants grow directly in the water in these pipes. This is just a quick overview slide of everything that we're gonna to talk to you guys about specific to our project. Now that we've given you background on our project. We're gonna go over system design, design elements of our system, system productivity, a financial analysis, and a political ecological analysis of our system. I'm gonna start off by talking to you about our system design. So as Kaylin had mentioned earlier, we have a Google SketchUp that we made, and so this is a model that we fully modeled our system <laughs> before we went and so that we could show it to our client. It had the piping system installed, and as you can see, we went with a media bed unit and a combination of NFT on top. We added the NFT at the end, or towards the end of our project, to ensure that there was proper filtration of the system. The system is scaled one-to-one -one plant fed size to fish tank size in order to allow appropriate filtration of the system. We use red lava rock in our system as our grow media, like I was talking about before. And we chose red lava rock because it can be found locally. It has doesn't have any effect on pH. It supports plants, plant growth very well. It has a relatively long lifespan. It has a medium cost compared to other types of grow media. And so the reason that we didn't go with deep water culture when we were making these considerations for our system is because of the climate in Costa Rica. It's very warm there year round. And so we had to put the fish tanks in the ground to moderate the temperature so that the water wouldn't get too hot. And with a deep water culture, we would have had additional water units to put into the ground. And so we decided to maximize our use of space by growing vertically and stacking an NFT system on top of 
a media bed system. So this is a picture of our design. This was the product as we left it when we left Costa Rica. And as you can see, we have the fish tanks in the ground with piping that feeds the water up to both the nutrient film technique pipes up top and the media bed. In those nutrient film technique pipes, there's little baskets that have the red lava rock in them as well. So the plants are in the grow media in those and water. We have two separate systems. We did this for a few reasons. One of the reasons is we wanted to make sure that if one system went down, there was still another functioning system. So if there was like fish disease or some other issue, we didn't have cross-contamination between the systems. Another reason is, as you can see, there are different depths. The deeper bed is good for growing more deeply rooted <coughs> vegetation like tomatoes, cucumbers, peppers, and then the shallower bed is better for lettuce, <coughs> herbs, and other type of vegetation like that and the nutrient film techniques are good for more shallowly rooted vegetation as well. So these are some of the pictures of uh, different stages of the construction process yeah, while we were there. If you can see the first picture, you can just see that when we arrived there was a metal frame and that was it. The ground wasn't leveled or anything. And so that was the very first day that we got to come out and see our system. And from there we worked with the help of the Puntiliano staff to implement our system. And so the picture below that right there, you can see we've made more progress. The legs for the system are in the ground, the tanks are in the ground, and that structure that you see inside is a roofing that we had to put up. The system is covered by mesh netting, as you can see in that last picture, it's green. And we did that so that there was proper aeration. We didn't want a greenhouse effect in our system because it's already so warm there and it would get too hot. So we needed proper aeration, but we also needed the plants and the fish tank to be covered. We didn't, the rains there can get really heavy and we didn't want the rain to damage the plants. And we also didn't want added rain water going into our system and contaminating anything. So I'm gonna give you an uh, introduction to the design elements of the system, starting with uh, an overview of the piping layout and moving on to the ideal flow rate for the systems and then onto the head loss calculations, which is essentially how much flow rate is lost from the piping. And then moving on to the pump selection, which provides enough flow for the system. So we chose 1.5 inch PVC pipe, which has PVC because it's ubiquitous and um, mostly safe and cheap and 1.5 inch size because smaller size has a much higher reduction in flow rate and larger size has, uh, will just take up too much space in the bed. The system is continuous flow, meaning it just uh, goes around and around, goes up from the you know, tank into the bed and then drains back. There's a pump down here which has an intake screen to prevent any fish from getting caught. And then as the water pumps up to here, there is this, which is a ball valve bypass, which allows us to regulate the flow of water to the bed. It continues up and reaches this T where the piping to the NFT gets added. It's not shown here, but there's a hose that is attached. And it also passes through this bulkhead fitting and goes to the bed. Right here, it splits and heads down to the two corners of the long side of the bed. Here's another view, this is where I was just talking about. It flows down to these corners, and then it, from the corner, it turns <coughs> along the short side of the bed, about halfway across the short side of the bed and then faces towards the center of the bed and then splits again. This was done so that there are no dry spots in the bed and so that um, all four corners get equal flow rate. Right around here is where the outflow system is. This is a, over a, more of a bird's eye view of the split at the two corners so you can visualize that better. And this is where the outflow is. In the last picture, this was covered by rocks the plants are not supposed to be entirely submerged in water, so there's a layer of rocks that goes over top of this. Um, the screen is to prevent any rocks from falling in. And these holes down here are to prevent water stagnation at the base of the outflow, and to also allow the system to drain more when, if the system were to decide to be turned off. This piping here is called overflow piping, and it only exists in case the outflow gets clogged and it prevents the water from spilling over the sides of the bed. So the ideal flow rate for the system is, it's ideal to uh, cycle the water, the entire volume of water for the aquaponic system twice per hour 
with a minimum flow rate of once every two hours. So the water volume for the small tank is about 1.2 cubic meters and the larger system is 2.4 cubic meters. And this is the range of flow rates which are acceptable. And this is our goal flow rate. So pump manufacturers, they, um, they pumps are uh, rated with a nominal flow rate, which is essentially the maximum flow rate that the pump can deliver. That flow rate only decreases as <coughs> water is lifted up or it flows through pipes as the gravitational and frictional effects cause the flow rate to decrease and energy to dissipate. This dissipation of energy is commonly called head loss and is calculated in units of length. Um, from there, pump manufacturers often provide a characteristic curve, which is a correlation of the head height to uh, the flow rate. And as the head increases, the flow rate will decrease. Using equations like these, I was able to calculate the head loss from the known parameters of the piping layout. And for the small system, the, uh, it's about 2.3 meters of head and 7.5 feet. And for large systems, about 5 or 8.5 feet. So this is an example of a characteristic curve. Knowing the 7.5 feet of the head, the ideal flow rate was about 635 gallons per hour. And so for the, the bar on the left is the model 9.5 which is a nominal flow rate of 950 gallons per hour, and seven and a half isn't shown here, six and eight are, but this is 600 and that's about 660, and so this is, it falls in the range of where we'd like the, uh, like the flow to be. This is just an example for the small system. We chose the Pondmaster Pond Mag 950 for the small system, <coughs> and for the large system, it was the Pond Mag, Pondmaster Pond Mag 2400. So the NFT, as was stated earlier, was added after the fact, after these calculations and pump selection were made, and this, uh, there was originally not enough flow to the NFT. There was no flow to the NFT when it was first installed. And so we had to include these ball valves to limit the amount of flow to the bed, and which instead diverted it up to the NFT. <coughs> that brought down the overall flow rate to 317 gallons per hour in the small system and 437 gallons per hour in the large system, which is still uh, safe in the range. So the NFT was, uh, didn't negatively affected. So for system productivity, the data was collected from mid-October to mid-April by the Punta Leona staff. Here's an image with nothing in it and then growing. We have a bar chart of total harvested quantity for each plant type. Lettuce is by far the most popular plant. We have bok choy, basil, chives, cucumber, peppers, and lettuce that are growing. And currently only chives, cucumber, peppers, and lettuce are growing. Lettuce is still by far the most popular. Here's an image of total harvested weights for each of the plant types. Lettuce is still the most, because it's the highest quantity. And um, chives, for example, is the, it has the largest drop off, mainly because it's the smallest plant, so it has, weighs the least per plant. So after seeing the productivity of the system, <clears throat> We wanted to figure out if this was a feasible investment for the resort. Um, and so we calculated the initial investment, the savings, and the payback period. And so the initial investment was calculated by compiling all the receipts of products that were purchased be between April 2017 and September 2017. And that brought us to a total of about $20,000 for the system. And this did not include labor, energy, or land. It's really only the product-based prices. And then from there, uh, we wanted to calculate the total savings on food for the resort. And so we looked at areas of tilapia, lettuce, cucumbers, and peppers. And we took a period of time of data that was sent to us from our client from August 2016 to February 2017. And this was a period before the system was implemented of how much money was being spent on these areas of food at the restaurant. And then a second period after the system was implemented from August 2017 to February 2018. So we assume that the difference between the two of these um, production costs is what this, the aquaponic system is supplementing. So that brings us to a savings of $2,000 uh, between those, the difference in those two periods. And then from there, using the initial investment and using the total savings, we were able to calculate a payback period of 10.3 years for this investment. <coughs> and we would also like to say that there is a steep learning curve with 
operating aquaponic systems and so uh, our client has been working on making this functioning at maximum capacity and so once it reaches that point uh, savings will increase and payback period will decrease as well so we could be looking at even a better payback period in a few years. Kiln and I are going to do a political ecological analysis. We're going to talk to you guys about the ecological aspects of our system. And so for a basis, political ecology is the study of the relationships between p political, economic, and social factors with environmental issues and changes. Modern day agriculture often uses synthetic, synthetic fertilizers to fuel their systems. And as I talked about earlier, since these are natural ecological cycles, we get our fertilizer in the system from the fish, and so we don't have to have added fertilizers into our system. The only regular input that we have are, is fish food, and that's fed to the fish once or twice daily. And as long as that's carefully managed and fed an appropriate amount, <coughs> we'll really be limiting the waste that our system produces. And fertilizers are, are costs both environmentally, they're bad for the environment when they run off into streams, and they have other effects, and they're also an extra monetary cost that we can avoid by using this system. Aquaponic systems are also really good at conserving water. They, like, as, I, as we've showed you, the water cycles from the fish, the fish live in this water, and the water is used to water the plants. So instead of using different irrigation methods like sprinklers or drip irrigation, other methods that have the capacity to lose a lot of water and magnify water loss, our system is really good at conserving water, and so overall the system is good because it cycles, recycles nutrients and water. So Paris talked a lot about the costs of <laughs> conventional agriculture um, that's typically used in country right now, and this kind of goes hand in hand with food miles and embodied energy. So Tim Lang defined food miles as the distance food travels as well as its ecological impacts accumulated along uh, that food chain. And so similarly, um, embodied energy is uh, energy consumed from all of the processes associated with producing that one item of food. Um, so the initial food system at the resort was uh, very meat heavy dishes which has high embodied energy and a lot of the food came from outside of a 100 kilometer radius so physically high food miles as well as um, other added costs along the way but by creating a system that had mainly local inputs and by this I mean the plant seedlings tilapia and lava rock all come from within a 100 kilometer radius of the resort and those are the three items that are most frequently replaced we were able to decrease the food miles and embodied energy. And all three of these inputs are managed in a cradle-to-cradle -cradle <coughs> practice, which reduces the amount of waste that enters into the global system. And so what I mean by this is um, any plants that can no longer be used for production or any fish waste are composted on site, and lava rock that is no longer functional in the system is used for landscaping. So it really isn't entering that global market of waste that can often be commodified and politicized. Um, as well as the fact that this new system uh, decreases the need for any packaging waste to meet shipping and sanitation requirements like the old food system did. Um, really, like I showed at the beginning of the presentation, the food is just traveling down the road, so there's no need for any additional <coughs> packaging. And um, so this is not a claim that by any means that the system has no ecological costs. There were materials that weren't avail available in country, so we did had to sh had to um, ship internationally, which has higher embodied energy. But we chose to have common vegetables uh, that could be served at both lunch and dinner, and so there was an availability of this sustainable food on every plate uh, at the resort. And so during lunch and dinner, this uh, fruit bar, which is usually served at breakfast, would just be replaced with a salad bar that's available at all times to customers. So overall, food miles and embodied energy decreased through this reformist approach to sustainable agriculture. 
And the third leg of our political ecological analysis is bringing in the degradation and marginalization thesis through tourism. So what you see in front of you are two photos. Um, <clears throat> one is a larger screenshot of all of the resorts and hotels that exist in Costa Rica and then a more zoomed in one of the coast of Costa Rica where we were. And so this is just to show that tourism is the backbone of the economy in Costa Rica and the degradation and marginaliza marginalization thesis states that local resources are overexploited due to an increased integration into global markets and these global markets being the tourist industry in this case and that was stated by Paul Robbins. Um, so to simplify that, as global tourists visit the resort, they exploit resources that were initially allocated for the permanent residents there and this creates a feedback loop of poverty and resource exploitation. So the impacts of this thesis can ultimately be limited by scaling down the resource intensive systems like food production that existed in the initial food system at the resort and can be exploiting fewer resources with this new system that's on site, scaled down and local. And this is by all means not a technical solution, but small efforts can lash up to form big impacts. In this case, this serves as an educational tool and uh, tourists can learn how to change their <coughs> travel practices and how they can reduce their overall environmental impact while still enjoying themselves in this great country. Um, so in conclusion, we uh, came to this conclusion that our project is ecologically viable compared to the initial system that existed at the resort and it's beneficial to them because it upholds their uh, standard <coughs> of being environmentally friendly and also educating all of their residents. But we would like to say that uh, in the future it could benefit from scaling up slightly so that it can provide for that maximum capacity that I talked about at the very beginning. So finally that brings us uh, to our acknowledgements. It really takes a village to get something like this together and we couldn't, couldn't have done it without all of the faculty and help here. Uh, in the ISAT department and beyond, specifically to our advisors, Dr. Altai and Dr. Conley, and also the Punta Leona staff, um, two of which are here today, Jose and Rainier, as well as the maintenance team that helped hands on with us during those three weeks that we were actually there. Um, to our honors thesis readers for all of the constructive criticism and critique, uh, Dr. Teal and Professor Bradburn. Uh, to the Dimensions of Political Ecology team, for helping us with our political ecological analysis, uh, Dr. Kaufman, Dr. Teal, Dr. Merton, and Dr. Yerko, and to Woods Edge Farm, to inspiring us and maybe even scaring us a little bit, um, owned and operated by Calvin, uh, helping us get started on this project and really showing us the ropes with aquaponics, and a former JMU student as well, Asa. And finally, to our parents for really providing that behind the scenes support. And so at this time, we'll take any questions. Thank you so much for being a great audience. I, didn't, uh, I may have missed it, but I didn't see any measurement for the tilapia produced. Um, Is that, that something you measured? Uh, there, we don't have any measurement of that. Now. Okay. When we got them, they're pretty small and they're still growing. And I'm not 100% sure we aren't collecting the data because it's being given to us. So uh -huh. it's like communication. Yeah, yeah. Um, but they are, a lot of them are still growing and it takes about six months for them to get full size. And those will be served at the resort also? Yeah. Can we ask them? <laughs> yeah, it's hard to count them. Uh -huh. I'm not going to take them out to measure them and put them back, so but they he's the one who collects them, so uh, but he's a chef too. 100 kilos so far. Oh, okay. Yeah. I know you guys only study Costa Rica, but is a different grow medium beneficial in a different climate? Like in a colder climate, would a different grow medium be better? I, grow medium it doesn't have an effect on that. Um, we, like I had said, we picked it because of how like local it is. I mean, there's tons of different types of grow medias that you can get in different areas, but that was like our main decision factor. And also there's a lot of different types of grow medias affect pH and other water quality effects differently. And so we wanted like a more low maintenance system, but. 
That's all I have for you. Actually, yep. ask, ask one question about uh, fish food. That seems to be your major outside input in uh -huh. terms of nutrients. Um, where does it come from, and and uh, are you seeing any effects of, of increased or too much nutrient in, in your system? I definitely think. I know that when we were there, there was too much nutrients in our system. It's, like I said, like collecting the data, we've been having some problems with. But um, our fish food, I definitely think we need to reduce the amount that's fed to it because there is a lot of nutrients in the system right now. And it's hard to, like, like we were talking about before, with passing over a project like this that's this complex and like this hard to manage, it just takes a while to get everyone on the same page and like everyone it's like a big learning process for all of us and so the amount of fish food and a few other aspects like that that will keep the nutrients at appropriate level to the vegetation that we have put in the system is going to take us some more time so we have been seeing some issues with that yeah to answer your question also about where it's coming from uh they purchased it from the same location that we got the fish from which is a less than an hour drive away so it's mm -hmm. still pretty local do you know approximately how large you'll have to scale up to meet that max limit that you're trying to get to? Um, it really depends on how much, because the system isn't working at maximum capacity right now, um, they would have to figure out like what that can feed, like what population that can feed, and then take it from there. <coughs> um, but yeah, that's a great question. Just a lot of further research there. How is the electricity produced for the pumps? What is it? What's the fuel source? Yeah, that's a great question and something that we had like made a lot of, I guess we talked a lot about um, at the beginning of our project because we were trying to figure out if we could connect to a photovoltaic uh, panel. Um, but we did some research and a lot of the grid power in Costa Rica is actually hydropower, so it's not as fossil fuel intensive as it would be like for here. Um, so that was like a bit more justifiable for us to uh, have the electricity directly c connected to the grid. Um, but correct me if I'm wrong, I've heard rumors that Punta Leona is investing in solar maybe? Yeah, we're in the process to probably be one of the first hotels that has a Tesla battery. Where so you would store you would store photovoltaic into the Tesla battery? Yeah. Any more questions? Thank you again. Thank you so much.